Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fibonacci and Elliott Wave Conference. Uh, it is such an, a great event, and it is highly, highly technical, so pay attention, take notes, and close any open browser, browsers that you may have on, because this event is really going to be worth uh, your time here. This event is brought to you, as always, by Timing Research and Trade Out Loud. The event is being fully recorded. All the recordings will be available as soon as they're processed on the timeyresearch.com website. David Cosmaner and I, Anka McCaff, will be your host today. And before we begin, as always, there is disclaimer, all information provided today is for educational purpose only. It should not be construed as investment advice regarding the purchase or sale of securities, options, futures, forex, or any instrument of any kind. Trading involves a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors because you could lose money. So before deciding to trade, you should carefully consider your objectives, level of experience, and risk appetite. Individual performance depends upon each person's skills, time commitment, and effort. Results may not be typical and individual results will vary. You must do your own research and make your own trading decisions. So with us today, we have a phenomenal lineup as highly technical traders that are really happy to share their strategies, tips, and tricks with you. And we're going to uh, start with Aldo. Aldo, you have the Mike Elliott Wave principle in a nutshell. I love that Elliott Wave made easy because everybody gets intimidated by Elliott Waves, right? So here is Aldo to break that uh, down for you. Thank have you very mind. much. Thank you so much. And welcome, everyone. Today is the first day of this wonderful event. And I had the privilege to have the first presentation. Therefore, I found it appropriate to begin with a short introduction of the Elliott Wave Principle. That way, you'll be much better prepared to understand the presentations of my colleagues. I don't want to spend too much time talking about me because that's not the reason why you are here. So let me make a rather quick, quick introduction. My name is Aldo La Gruta, and I'm joining you from Germany, where I currently live. I'm a certified Elliott Wave Analyst and a financial technician from the International Federation of Technical Analysis. I'm also a member of the Society of Technical Analysis in London and have been awarded for the accuracy of my forecasts and papers. Up until 2018, I worked as an analyst for a London-based company providing analysis and forecasts to thousands of professionals and corporate traders. And by now, I've probably taught the wave principle to thousands of people, both professionals and amateur traders. So let's begin. As the great Yogi Berra would say, Trading is 90% strategy and the other half psychology. Obviously, that's a joke. Success in trading involves strategy, sure, but it also requires a unique psychological approach and money management. On top of that, there are three requirements for any trading strategy to function forecast, timing, and trade management. That basically correspond to the what, when, and how. What should I do? Should I buy? Should I sell? Is the market going to go up or down? That's forecast. When should I do it? That's timing. And how should I do it? That's trade management. Without the first requirement, that means forecast, no strategy will ever work. But in order to be able to forecast, traders need to learn analysis. Most traders don't know how to analyze properly. And in my opinion, there is no better analytical system than the Elliott Wave Principle. Elliott practitioners have a different approach to trading because we think in patterns and place our stops according to those patterns. That by itself automatically changes our psychological approach to the market. And that's probably the most important transformation that the Elliott Wave Principle gives us with. 
there are two major things the wave principle does for us. One, it helps us transform an infinite number of possibilities into a handful of probabilities. And that in turn circles back to the confidence and psychological effects that we were just mentioning. So the second one is that it produces a psychological transformation that we experience progressively as we gain experience and confidence forecasting and interpreting what prices could do. But the real practical power of the wave principle doesn't end there. As an analyst, I can say that the biggest contribution that the wave principle brings is that it predicts accurately where the market is more likely to move next. Now I should clarify something of utmost importance. The wave principle is not a trading methodology. It is an analytical tool but it can be successfully used as a trading methodology. In fact, I should say that practically no technical tool has the power to identify the most likely turn with the accuracy that the wave principle does. And with that in mind, you get perfect guidance as to where to enter and exit positions and where to place your stops for the highest probability of success. What you see in front of you summarizes the entire wave theory. I know that many of you have been told that the wave principle is extremely complex and subjective. Well, we think the opposite. The extraordinary simplicity of the wave principle could be deceiving. It is so unbelievably simple that it feels like going back to kindergarten where you learn how to count up to five and you also learn your ABCs. At its most basic level, wave analysis is simply the identification of patterns in market prices. What patterns, you ask? Well, Elliot noticed that social behavior moves, trends, and reverses in recognizable patterns. In other words, crowd behavior is predictable. He isolated 13 patterns of, or waves that recur over and over again. So he named them, he defined those patterns and illustrating, he illustrated them in amazing details. He then described how they link together to form larger versions of themselves, how they link to form the same patterns of the next larger size or larger degree to produce a predictable progression. And that is what is known today as the Elliott Wave Principle. As his main research tool, Elliott used the stock market and notice that though 13 patterns, let's call them waves, were always there, they happen over and over again in the price data. When you are able to identify these patterns and where they are likely to occur in the overall path of the market, then you have one of the most effective forecasting tools that exist. What you have in front of you summarizes it all. That's all there is to Elliott Wave. Five waves in one direction, and three waves in the opposite direction. Simple. But simple is not necessarily easy. And because of that, way too many people try to learn the wave principle using the same approach they use for learning other trading tools, and then they fail. Then, of course, they spread the many objections and criticisms that we hear way too often about the wave principle. As I just mentioned, Elliot basically observed the crowd behavior. In other words, market psychology. And there are two sides to the psychology of the marketplace. One, I'm sorry, I'm seeing a message here. Okay. One is the effect 
that the market has on a trader. And the next one is the effect that a trader has on the market. We all know the effect that the market has on a trader. We have experienced it. We know that the market uh, does something to us. Many of you have probably felt and concluded that emotions are your biggest nemesis. The effect that a trader has on the market is that is what is known as crowd psychology. And crowd psychology is not a phenomenon exclusively explained by the Elliott Wave principle. Every single pattern that you see on your charts has been explained by traditional technical analysis as the result of mass psychology. You have all heard of V reversals. The news and politicians are always telling you about V reversals. The head and shoulders that some of you have heard because it is one of the most common chart patterns known, the flag, a pennant, a rectangle, a triangle, a diamond, you name it. They are all the result of crowd behavior. And that is the collective psychology of the market participants. Now, let's consider carefully what I'm saying here, because this is key for us as analysts. Basically, Elliot observed that market moves because the collective psychology of the participants, not because the fundamentals. If we are to succeed in the markets, we need to become proficient in technical analysis. And in order to become proficient in technical analysis, we must understand its premises. So please pay close attention to these and take notes. These are the three premises on which technical analysis is based. Market action discounts everything. Prices move in trend and history repeats itself. I do hope you will remember these three tenets. They will help in your decisions in the future, even if you don't count waves. So we technicians, we believe that anything that can possibly affect the price, being political, economical, psychological, or otherwise like a natural disaster, will be reflected on price. Hence, the study of price is all that is required, and price form patterns. Here are the 13 patterns that Elliot identified. It's only 13. Now, if we tried learning them this way, it would be pretty difficult to remember them. But if we frame them a bit uh, dif differently, it becomes rather simple. So let's try to simplify them so you can learn them at once. The 13 patterns that Elliot identified can be easily framed into two major forms of wave development, motive waves and corrective waves. All other patterns we saw in the previous slide are nothing but variations of these motives and corrective waves. Therefore, let's just memorize these two right now, motives and correctives. Motive waves are the ones that move in the direction of the trend and have a five wave structure. They can be impulses and diagonals. That's okay, you can learn that later. Corrective waves interrupt the trend and have a three wave structure. They can be zigzags, flats, and triangles. Let me introduce you to all of them, but we'll be focusing on impulses. Even if that's the only thing you learn from me today, you'll be in a much better position. And the reason is because impulses are the ones that identify the trend and you'll be able to forecast the next move 
and that's what it's all about forecasting i'll show you in a second i'm going to just make it drawing for you because it's a lot easier for you to remember so i'm going to use an empty space here and i'm going to start with the easiest uh, corrective pattern remember there are three zigzags flats and triangles so let's start with a zigzag the zigzag looks like well like a zigzag okay that's that's a zigzag and it's labeled as a b c the next pattern is something that looks pretty much like a zigzag but see let's label this as a hey uh aldo we're yes sir? we're only we're only seeing the slide if you're trying to show a chart we're not uh, seeing Okay, then let me, oh yeah, because I have to switch. Okay, so let me try this. Okay, so now you can see my charts. Uh, yeah, yeah, we see a blue line. Exactly, okay. So basically this would be the A, this would be the B, let's label it like that, and a C here. And this is what is known as a zigzag. The next pattern is something very similar than the zigzag. But you will notice that the zigzag retrace, the B of the zigzag retrace probably half of it, probably 62% of it. Whereas the next pattern, the A, it's similar to the, to the one of the zigzag, but the B goes all the way to the origin of A and the C goes down. It's like an inverted N when we're talking about an uptrend. And finally, the last pattern is the um, triangle. And guess what? The triangle looks like a triangle. It's labeled as A, B, C, D, and E. Basically, the B, let's, let's label them so you can have it easy. The B leg typically wants to go above the origin of A, but cannot. Then the C tries to go beyond the end of A, but cannot. The D tries to go above the origin, the end of B, but cannot. And finally, the E cannot go beyond the end of C. And that forms a triangle. Okay, so basically we have three main corrections, the zigzags, the flats, and the triangles. Now let's focus on the impulses, okay? Because as I said, if we focus on the impulses, you're probably going to be in great, great shape. The impulses, as I said, are the ones that move in the direction of the trend. Okay, and they subdivide into five waves. One, two, three, four, and five. Notice that we label the impulses with numbers. One, two, three, four, and five. Whereas the corrections, we label them with letters. Okay, that's why I said it's like going back to kindergarten where you learn to count up to five and an ABC. In markets, and according to Elliot, in nature, progress ultimately takes the form of five waves of specific structure. Three of these waves, which are the ones we labeled as one, three, and five, actually affect the directional movement. You can see here that these are the ones that go in the direction of the main trend. By the way, there is no zero, okay? We start with the one at the end of one, the two at the end of two. So the one, three, and five waves that are the ones that actually affect the directional movement are separated by two counter trend interruptions, which are labeled two and four. So you can see how one, three, and five are separated by this one, 
2 and 5. Elliot noticed three consistent aspects of the five-way form, and they were so consistent that in order to correctly identify and label the structure as an impulse wave, which is a type of motive wave, the analyst must make sure that these three aspects are present and respected. In other words, they are the rules by which impulse waves must adhere. And I'm starting with the rules because you must know the rules as you know your name if you want to use elite waves. Everything depends on them. Where you put your stop, where you place your, your target, where you where your, where your setups will be um, found. They, they all uh, de are dependent upon the rules. And if you learn them now, in the first introduction, it will be a lot easier for you to understand the rest of the classes that you will be attending in these three days. I have to change screen again, I suppose, to go back to my presentation. So let me do that. And please let me know if you are seeing the presentation again. Okay, I'm going to continue because I'm not getting a response. So I'm assuming yes. All right, so the three rules are wave two, never moves beyond the start of wave one. Wave three is never the shortest wave of one, three, and five. And wave four never ends in the price territory of wave one. These three rules are of major importance. So please commit them to memory at once. So you have them there in front of you. And I'm going to give you a, a hint of how to memorize them. But I'm going to go back to the, <laughs> to the chart so I can draw there. So the first rule was wave two never moves beyond the end of wave one. That means that this wave can never go lower than the low of wave one. So if we had something like one, two, that's not possible. That is, that violates the first rule, okay? Then we have the next rule. Wave three is never the shortest wave. So let's say that we had something like one, two, three, four, and five. That couldn't be an impulse wave because it violates the rule because wave three would be the shortest of one, three, and five. And finally, wave four cannot end in the price territory of wave one. So basically what we have here is that we couldn't have wave one, two, three, four inside wave one here and then five. Even if we had something like that, we have to know that that is not an impulse wave because it just doesn't follow the rules. These rules are never, ever, ever, never to be violated. They have to be, they must be at all times respected. Okay, so if you are going to label a chart using Elliott waves, those three rules must be there. And it's, it is so important because these are the three rules that determine if an impulse is indeed an impulse. If the impulse does not follow those rules, then it is not an impulse. And here is the trick. Impulses are the ones that determine the trend. So if you spot an, Im uh, an impulse, you pretty much know where the trend is. Therefore, 
is that important. That's why I said, if we get to remember these, um, these uh, rules for impulses and you get to understand what an impulse wave is, you're going to be really uh, far away. So how to memorize them? Well, I would suggest do that in order. Notice that the first rule refers to the first. Remember, the first refers to the first. That means that wave two can never retrace more than 100% of the distance traveled by the first. So the first refers to the first. First rule is wave two can never retrace more than 100% the distance traveled by wave one. After these two waves, what's coming? Well, it's coming wave three. So that's the next rule. The next rule is wave three can never be the shortest. The shortest of what? The shortest of wave one, three, and five. Then comes the next rule. And what is the next wave after wave three? Well, then wave four. So the next rule refers to wave four. Wave four can never end in the price territory of wave one. Okay, so now that you have these three rules down, let's say you have them in place, I want to draw for you something and you tell me if that something could be considered an impulse. But first I will need to see where do I see your answer. So let me take a second to, to erase this first and also try to uh, spot the chat where you are going to be telling me if the drawing respects the rules or if it doesn't. Oh, okay. So let me try uh, that. Did you, yes, find, sir. did you find the chat? I found the chat. I think I put the chat window on the site in case. Thank you very much, David. Okay, great. Okay, so here we go. Let's try this one. Is this a, is this an impulse? Okay, not an impulse, why not? Okay, we got some no's, but I want to know why not? Because force enters the territory of wave one. Congratulations, thank you very much. Okay, so here we have another one. Uh, hold on, <laughs> I'll do it again. Okay, so let's see, is this an impulse? We have some no's. All right, so you guys, said something very important here. And several of you said that. It is not the same when we say that wave three can never be the shortest, as to say wave three should be the longest. Okay, so wave three can indeed, uh, or tends to be the longest indeed, at least in, in the stocks and in Forex, not so much in commodities. In commodities, the wave five tend to be the longest. But you could have, let's say this is wave one, this is wave two, this is wave three, okay? This is wave four, and this is wave five. We could have that. Doesn't look beautiful, but it is an impulse. And you know why? Because we can go through the rules. Wave two did not travel more than 100% of the distance traveled by wave one. Wave three is not the shortest, it's longer than wave one. 
and wave four did not end in the price territory of wave one. So even though wave three here was not the longest, it wasn't the shortest. Therefore, it still qualifies as an impulse. I hope that that is clear for you. Okay, so let's throw another one. Maybe your answers will help me uh, clarify your, your doubts. Here's another one. We have one, we have two, we have three, we have four and five. Does that qualify? Okay. Um, we have some no's. Um, I missed some questions, so let me try to go up there because I spotted a question. A question said, can wave five be longer than wave three? The answer is yes. I thought traditional wave three is always the longest. That is incorrect. Traditional wave three is the longest only when we're talking about the stocks and currencies, but when we're talking about commodities, the longest is the fifth traditionally. That doesn't mean that they are going to be like that all the time, but you're talking traditionally and that's the case. Correct, you are correct. Whoever says it doesn't qualify because the two travels more than 100% of wave one. Now, wave two can be, can produce a double bottom there. It can be exactly at the same level but it cannot go one tick or one pip uh, beyond it, okay? So trying to erase this, and apparently I cannot. Okay, so I won't. <laughs> okay, so now you seem to have understood these three rules. So there is something else that I want to tell you about um, the impulses. And that is that each wave of the impulse must develop in five as well. In other words, each one of those legs, one, three, and five of the impulses should also have five legs. And those five legs should also respect the rules. Okay, so let's say that we have something like that. Well, one, two, three, four, five, and then we have an A, B, C. And now we have another one, two, three, four, five, and then an A, B, C. And then another one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so what we have here is basically the five wave moves that we were looking at before, but we are looking at it in details, we're looking at it with a microscope, okay? So this is st still the wave one, and this is still the wave two. This, oh well, <laughs> you, you, you imagine the wave two. This is still the wave three, and this is the wave four, and this is the wave five. Now, each one of them must have five legs. Now, let's go again through the rules. Wave two can never travel one hundred, more than 100% of the distance traveled by wave one. It didn't, so check. Wave three is never the shortest, so it isn't. Check. Wave four can never end in the territory, the price territory of wave one. It didn't, so check. So we have the five, the, the three rules for these five legs here. So we can say this is an impulse. And now each one of these impulses are subdivided into five waves as well. And each one of them must have those rules um, respected. So here is the one, here is the two. The two did not travel more than 100% of, of the price territory of one. The three is not the shortest, the four the end, the territory of wave one, and the five, same here, one, Two, two didn't travel more than 100%, three is not the shortest, four didn't enter the price territory of wave one. Same thing here, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so now this is what is known in the Elliott Wave Principle as different degrees. So what we do is 
that we differ differentiate these degrees by using uh, circles around the numbers, for instance, to represent the primary degree, okay, of the entire impulse up, okay? And then inside those, we get also a one, a two, a three, etc. The difference is that in order to differentiate them from the primary degree, we use parentheses, okay? As simple as that. No, the ABC are not the fractals. Fractals refers precisely to what we're talking about. Fractals refers that to the fact that these five waves here is a microscope of these five waves here. In other words, these five waves that we have here are only the building block of a larger five waves, which are also the building block of a larger five wave, with, which is also the building block of a larger five wave, etc., etc., etc. So to put it in a different way, for instance, this uh, one right here should also be subdivided into five waves. And these five waves should also follow the rules. And these three should have the five waves as well. These five should also respect the five waves. Okay, and so what we do is that in order to represent these different degrees, we use something uh, to differentiate them. Basically, at first, let's call this a wave one. We call this a primary degree. Basically, we put them into a circle. And then the degree lower than that one, in other words, this one, the one of one in circle, we put them in parentheses. It's easy to remember because we know that it's missing something, right? To be like the big one. And of course, the one here of the one of the one, we put them outside parentheses. So we call these different degrees by name, but you don't have to really memorize that at the moment. I'm going to tell you basically this is a primary degree, this is the intermediate degree, and this is the minor degree. Nothing really important for you at the moment, except to understand that each wave has different degrees. If a higher degree, smaller segments violate the five waves, is the larger segment invalidated? Well, indeed, indeed, because they all should have the, the rules respected. Let's say, for example, let's say that, let's we'll try to move this. I won't be able to move it. Okay, let's put it up there. Let's say that we have this. One, two, three, four, five of one, A, B, C, three, four, and five. Can we say that this is a one, two, three, four, and five? Well, what do you guys say? Could we say that? No, why not? <laughs> because it violated the rules. The very first leg here was violated by the wave two, the, su the supposed wave two, which traveled more than 100% of wave one. Therefore, being this violated, we cannot say that these five waves are correct. Therefore, we cannot say that this is the one. If this is not the one, then this cannot be the two, the three, the four, and the five. Simple, right? So what I want to do now, because we have only a few more minutes to go, what I want to do now is take this chart itself and let me make it bigger. I'm assuming that you're seeing my, my chart, aren't you? I'm hoping that this is what you are seeing. So, and I want to ask you guys, yeah, thank you very much. And I want to ask you guys if you can tell me if this move 
here. I'm trying to make it bigger for you, but apparently it won't let me. So we're going to have to work with it like that. So I want to know if you guys think that there are five waves here, and if so, if they respect the rules. Uh, the question is, what bars, I suppose you're talking about what uh, chart type is best to use to identify waves, right? And the, there is not one that is best, there is only one that is possible. <laughs> when you count waves, you can only count waves with bars. You cannot count waves with candles. And the reason is because candles have shadows and those shadows completely color the uh, picture. So basically, I want to give you a little trick before I leave you. And the little trick is very simple. Whenever you see a chart and you want to label it, it is important that you actually step back. Don't lean forward, do the opposite. You know, typically we tend to lean forward, right? We want to do the opposite. And we want to do something that I call the helicopter view. Of course, you won't find that anywhere. This is just my version of it. The helicopter view means that you are going to take a altitude, okay? And then you are going to spot the highs and the lows that are actually relevant. And then you are going to uh, go for those first to see if there are five ways there. Because we have limited time, I'm going to do this for you. So I'm going to start with the meaningful law here, okay? So I'm going to take altitude, I'm going to take uh, some distance and go up, obviously down, I go down here because, well, this is higher than that, so this will be down. And from here, I would say up, down, up, down, up, down, maybe to this one, and then up again, right? So now, we can see, is this a five-way move? Well, if you recall, we said that each one of the legs should subdivide into five legs, remember? And one of those legs typically is going to be extended, the term extension tends to really intimidate people. The only thing it means is that one of them will be longer than the other, okay? So the extended, the longest leg will probably be the one in all likelihood that will show all the subdivisions of those five waves. So basically what's gonna happen is that, I'm going to use the labels here because it's going to be a lot easier to write. Uh, it's going to be one, two, and then I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, four, three, and then I'm going to say A, B, C for four, and then one, two, three, four, five, four, five. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, now I'm going to erase the helicopter view just to clean the chart a little bit. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the degrees that we just uh, use here, just to make them clearer for you in terms of the primary, the one that we spoke about, and we put it in a circle, remember? And then the intermediate in parentheses, which is, should be the one inside the circle, and then the minor outside parentheses, which should be the ones inside the ones in parentheses, okay? And in order to do that, we just click here and we're going to go for the primary, okay? And that would put us uh, with the proper uh, labels there. And now what we're going to do is we're going to label the inside, Uh, we were going to put the insides of these waves, okay? So we're going to do one, two, probably three, four, and five, 
those are the five waves of the primary, the, in, the subdivisions of the primary. Therefore, I'm going to put them in parentheses. Okay. So now we have the inside labels of the third wave, which in this case, by the way, was the longest. Okay, and because it was the longest, we would say in very sophisticated terminology that it was extended. But if we go here, we could also see the five subdivisions. I'm gonna show them very quickly to you. Uh, you can see this would be the one, this would be the two. And now we have one, two, three, four, five, or three, four, and five. And that simple way, you can see how easy it could be to spot a proper impulse. Now, we have to make sure, we have to make sure that all of them follow the rules. Okay, so let's go for it again. Did wave two travel, wave two primary, okay? Did wave two primary travel more than 100% uh, <laughs> than the distance traveled by wave one? No, thank you very much. Is wave three the shortest? No, thank you very much. Is wave four ending inside the price territory of wave one? No, in fact, it's far away. Okay, so that means that the primary labels that we had there perfectly qualify. Now, let's see the subdivisions, the intermediate. Okay, here we have wave two. Did it travel more than 100%? No. Is three the shortest? No. Of one, three, and five, three is not the shortest. And finally, did wave four enter inside the territory of one? Of the same degree, by the way, notice this is four, okay? We're talking about four in parentheses, in other words, fourth intermediate is not inside the one intermediate. Therefore, it perfectly qualifies. Primary is intact regarding rule one. Actually, it's intact regarding rules one, two, and three. Okay, so basically guys, that's Elliott wave made easy for impulses. Now, of course, you're going to have to learn diagonals, which have a different set of rules. And of course, you are going to have to learn the three major um, corrections. That means zigzags, flats, and triangles. Everything else, all those patents, all those 13 patents that we spoke about that Elliot identified, they are simple variations of that. For example, we said that a flat does something like that, right? Uh, down up to the origin of A and then down again. Well, sometimes the flats do the same, except that in, instead of going to the origin of A, they go a little bit higher. Yeah, And then they are a variation of the flat and they are called expanded flat. That's all, but it's continue. Uh, it's still a flat. And sometimes those expanded flat, they, uh, the wave C ends not beyond the end of wave A, and then we call them running flat. But you don't have to worry too much about those because they are simple variations of the same theme. So the most important thing for you at the moment, if you are starting to learn Elliot, is basically to learn the two main waves. Motive waves, they go in the direction of the trend, and corrective waves, they go against the trend. Remember how we spoke about zigzags? Here we have a single zigzag. Oops, I tried to write there. there. Here is a zigzag. Remember the, the, the drawing that I made? There it is, simple very easy for you. Now, I am about to end the presentation now. So in this last minute that I have, I want to give you a gift, 
okay? And I want to give you a gift as a thank you for spending this time with me, or actually I should say with us, and for attending the presentation. So if you like what you learn and you'd like to continue learning with me, I teach an Elliott Wave intensive bootcamp that runs for an entire week. It's very intensive. It typically sells for $497. But here's the thing. I don't do that boot camp very often. In fact, sometimes I spend years without doing them. So basically we sell the recordings for 50 bucks of the last boot camp I did. That was two years ago, maybe, and maybe a year ago. And what I want to do is I want to give uh, those recordings to you for free. Just as a way to say thank you for spending this time with us today. All you have to do is to go to the page and I'm going to show you the page because it will be the easiest way for me not to mess it up. Okay, let me see if I'm here. I am going to try to see if I can get out of this presentation. And if you could see, do you see a page there? Okay, good. I so, he, great, thank you. So here it is. The, the address is Elliot Wave Made Easy, that net forward slash bootcamp. Okay, and there you can see that's the, the our bootcamp's recording. Okay, the bootcamp typically serves for $497. The recording is only for $50. And all you have to do to get them for free is just use a coupon that I'm going to give you now. So you can um, take advantage of this offer if you want to learn more or everything about Elliot. Then you go here where it says, have a coupon code. Okay, and right there, type uh, I'm going to try to type if I can. Apparently, I cannot type. Uh, let's see. No, I cannot. Oh, yes, I can. So type E W M E. That means Elliot Wave Made Easy. Uh, dash, not there, sorry. Elliot Wave Made Easy, dash free. Okay, and then you click apply. Make sure that you go through this process because when you click apply, you'll see the 5550 here uh, changing to, well, if it does, oh, it's not changing. <laughs> and the reason is because when I'm sharing a screen, the, for some reason, the mouse doesn't go well. Okay, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my uh, slides. So you have it there written. Okay, and there it is, Elliot Wave Made Easy that net bootcamp, and there you have the free coupon, E W M E dash uh, dash free. Okay, and basically, guys, that's all that you have for me. If you if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer for about one or two more minutes, but that's about all the time we have. Actually, it is, thank you. It is my pleasure to be able to help you understand Elliott Wave. So I'm happy that you can take advantage of this. Um, what? Um, I'm sorry, but the questions are coming too fast and I'm missing them. Just a second. Let me try to make them big so I don't miss anything. Just got the link. Um, there are many thank yous. This event will be 10 hours of presentations today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Uh, okay, and you have to know something, guys. This coupon is only valid for one week. So I strongly advise you to use it right away. Even if you cannot study the recordings right now because you will be busy with the event, you want to register before the coupon expires, okay? Once the coupon expires, we're not going back and create other coupons or anything like that, okay? So please do that while you have it in front of you. It will be a lot easier for you to remember. Okay, and since I don't see any more questions coming in, 
Okay, there are something to analyze. Do you normally start with daily charts for waves? To analyze, you can start from whatever chart you use. It doesn't really matter. If you ask me in order to create a thorough analysis and you give me a 15 minute chart, I'll probably will analyze that chart, but we'll ask you, yes, but can I have an hourly chart as well? And maybe later I'm going to ask you, can I have a 300 minute chart too? And then I probably will ask you, and can I have the daily chart now? And then after that, I probably will put together a full analysis, right? But you can analyze a chart, whatever chart you, whatever chart you are. You can analyze a one minute chart if you wanted to. Can you put the link in the chat? Um, I don't really know if I can. Can I? I think I probably can, but I don't dare because I probably <laughs> I have a fat finger. Not to say a fat, a fat stomach. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. That's all for me today. Thank you so much. Uh, David, I give you back the microphone. It was a pleasure to be with all of you. And David, thank you very much for inviting me to be with all of you today.